Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. You will hear a telephone conversation between an owner of a restaurant and a customer who is calling to find out information about food and prices at the restaurant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, Bellucci's restaurant. Sam speaking. How may I help you? Hi, my name's David Marsden and I'm calling to ask about the offers I saw on the website for your restaurant. I'm thinking about organising a party for a friend's birthday. Yes, Mr Marsden. What information would you like to know? You can call me David. OK, great. So, David, what can I help you with? Well, first of all, I wanted to know if the 50% offer that you have on for certain dishes is valid for weeknights as well as on the weekend. The party may take place during the week, you see. Well, there are many dishes that are 50% off on weekends and only a small number of dishes are 50% off during the week. For example, the spaghetti bolognese is 50% off on whatever day you come in during this month, and lasagnas and steaks are 50% off on our most busy days, which are Saturday and Sunday. Would you be able to do a discount on the lasagnas if there was a large group of people coming in during the week? We can only do a 25% discount. But we can do a 50% discount for large groups on any dessert you have with the lasagna. Well, that sounds like a good deal. There are many other offers that we have on at the moment as well. What about drinks? Are there any discounts on drinks? Yes, of course. For every three bottles of house red or white wine ordered, you will get a bottle free. So that is four bottles of wine for only about £25. If you order two bottles of champagne, you will get half a bottle free of charge as well. That sounds like a really good offer. Which house wine do you stock? Most restaurants have French house wine and sometimes Spanish, but I think most of my friends will want to drink Italian wine. We normally serve French as the house wine, but we will be able to find a nice Italian one instead if you prefer. That would be great. What about champagne? We will probably order at least two really good bottles. How much would a good bottle cost? Well, you're in luck, because the champagne used to cost £25 per bottle, but now it's only £20 per bottle, so you'll save £5. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. 
Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. That sounds like a good price based on my experience. Uh, now, what side dishes are on the menu that could be ordered with the lasagnas? Well, we have a range of side dishes. Some go better with the lasagna than others, but of course, it's your choice. The chef's special side dish is a chicken and cheese dish. This may be too heavy to have with lasagna. But we have a selection of salads, such as a mixed salad and a Greek salad. They would be the best option with that main course. Some other side dishes that are popular are tomato bread with herbs and Italian cheese with peppers. That all sounds very tasty, and I'm sure all the people who are coming to the party will like these types of dishes. I might come in during the week to try out some of your food before the party. So, would you like to reserve the table then for your party? Yes. I was wondering if you have any tables free for the 20th of August. <sighs> I'm afraid we're all booked up on that date. But we can reserve a table for you for the week after on the 27th of August. Is that OK? Yes, that will be fine. How many people will there be? Fifteen. Can we have the table for seven o'clock on that evening? Yes, that can be arranged. Uh, please, can I take your phone number for the booking? Yes, it's 01445 333 6451. OK, that's great. Can I also take your email address to send you information about the restaurant and update you about offers and evening entertainment? Sure, it's david.hamill at worthing.com. D A V I D dot H A M I L L at W O R T H I N G dot com. Great. Well, I think that's all I need for the moment. We'll be in touch closer to the date when you'll be coming to the restaurant. If you want to ask anything or order anything special, we can cater for most requests. Yes, that would be good, as I'm sure I'll think of something. Bye-bye, David. Speak soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the history of tennis. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 and 12. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 and 12. Good afternoon and welcome to the programme. Today we have a special programme about the history of tennis in this country and we also have Steve Mackay in the studio, the all-time great British tennis player, to give us the lowdown on some interesting facts about the sport and other great tennis players. Steve... Obviously, tennis is one of the most popular sports broadcast on TV today. 
Can you tell us about the early days of tennis? Well, the medieval form of tennis is known as real tennis and eventually became lawn tennis, which is what we know today. Real tennis changed over three centuries from an earlier ball game played around the 12th century in France. This had some similarities to handball. People would hit a ball with a bare hand and later with a glove. People say this game was played by monks in monasteries. By the 16th century, the glove had become a racket. Real tennis spread in popularity throughout royalty in Europe and was the most popular in the 16th century. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. It's amazing how the sport has changed then over time and how technology has helped to advance it with the state-of-the-art tennis rackets that we have today. So, what about the players who will go down in history as the best at this sport? Who do you think will be remembered on the Wall of Fame? Well, obviously I have many favourites. And all tennis players have different styles and will be remembered for different aspects of their game. The first player, though, that has to be mentioned is the great Bjorn Borg. He will go down in history due to the fact that he won 11 Grand Slam singles titles between 1974 and 1981, five at Wimbledon and six at the French Open. Born in 56 in Sweden, Borg became the youngest winner of the Italian Championship just before his 18th birthday, and two weeks later, he was the youngest winner of the French Championship. Borg is the only player in the Open era to have won both Wimbledon and the French Open in the same year more than once. Another very important tennis player is Boris Becker. He was born in 1967 in Lyman, West Germany, and he is a six-time Grand Slam singles champion. Since he retired in 1999 from the professional tour, media work and his personal life have kept him in the headlines. An interesting aspect of his career is the fact that he was the youngest ever male Grand Slam singles champion, winning Wimbledon at 17 years, 7 months. Moving on to our next great player, we have Pete Sampras. He was born on August 12, 1971 in Washington, D.C., and during his 15-year career, he won 14 Grand Slam men's singles titles. His flair for the game was evident at age three when he discovered a tennis racket in the basement of his home and spent hours hitting balls against the wall. His parents are of Greek origin. He has given some truly unforgettable performances on the court over the years. The final player I will mention is the great Andre Agassi, he was born on April the 29th in 1970 in Las Vegas, Nevada. During his career, he won four Australian Open titles, one French Open, one Wimbledon and two US Open, which gives a total of eight Grand Slam titles. An interesting aspect of his career was that he turned professional at the age of 16 and his first tournament was in La Quinta, California. He won his first match against John Austin, 6-4, 6-2, but then lost his second match to Mats Willander, 6-1, 6-1. By the end of the year, Agassi was ranked world number 91. These players really have achieved a great amount in their lives, and they will be talked about for years to come, especially when the Wimbledon Championships come round in June. Steve... Which one is your ultimate favourite? Oh, I just can't answer that. They all evoke great memories in the world of tennis, and they have all contributed so much to the game.
Their names will always be inscribed on the Wall of Champions. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear four students discussing a conference they want to organise at their college. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. So, Mr Peters has finally agreed that we can organise this year's college conference. So, we need to really go through all the most important items in order to establish a general schedule for the conference and how we are going to put it all together. Yes, I agree. We can't leave things to the last minute. And there are quite a lot of good speakers who have offered their services for this conference. It's important that things go smoothly. Don't forget that Mr Peters has been against the idea of this conference for the last two years. So we need to make it worthwhile and get at least 100 students to attend so that we can prove this is an event that students can benefit from. The most important thing we need to consider is the range of speakers who we will invite to the conference. If they are well respected in their different fields, then the students will be very keen to come and hear the talks. We don't have a massive budget either, so we have to negotiate on the fees that the speakers will charge. Hmm. Sam, you mentioned before this meeting that you have had some calls from some interesting potential speakers. Can you give us the lowdown on the rough list that you have at the moment? Yes. The main person on my list who is an expert in the field of business management is Professor Harmon. He would be good at running workshops where students can discuss how to start a business and he likes to include role plays which make the sessions more interesting. Yes, I've heard of him and people have told me that he is dynamic and interesting. He doesn't like just giving lectures. He likes to get the students involved more in the discussion. We should definitely send him a formal invitation. What about another area of study, such as maths? Well, I have done some research on Mr Steve Bishop. I heard about him because my brother went to see him give a lecture at a university in his area. Apparently, he is well respected among many universities in England for his knowledge in the field of maths. He has even done some research with some famous mathematicians. My sister studies maths at university, and I think he came to her university too to give some extra lectures. He would be a good one to keep on the list. I could send the invitation to him if you want, Sam. That would be great, thanks. We have speakers now to talk about business and mathematics, so it would be a good idea to invite someone who is an expert in an art subject, like English or drama. I haven't actually got any ideas for art subjects. Well, I'm planning to do drama at university, and I know of a lady who is the head of drama at a well-known university. Her name is Sandra Bolton. She would give some drama seminars where students can discuss aspects of theatre and production in smaller groups. 
I also know a professor called Mr. Max Wallington. He is a professor of English literature, and he would come and give a lecture about Shakespeare. I'll send invitations to Miss Bolton and Mr. Wallington then. Great. That's two art subjects covered then. The final main subject area we need to think about is science. Dave, you want to study biology at university, don't you? Do you know of any professors we can contact? Well, there's the famous professor Sean O'Brien. He's done quite a lot of work in the field of genetics. I'm sure all the budding scientists will really want to come and hear him speak. As well as this, there's the mad scientist Jeff O'Hara, who is very knowledgeable about Albert Einstein, and he can come and talk about his famous theories. Perfect. Now that we have some speakers in mind to cover the main areas of study, we need to think about the administration and organisation of the conference. To start with, we need to send the invitations out to all the speakers we have agreed on on school-headed paper. Kate, Lucy, and I will take care of that. Dave, would you be able to contact a photographer to come and take pictures for the newsletter that will be printed after the conference? Yes, I know a good photographer who's come to the college for some other events. I will contact him as his photos were of really good quality. Lucy, would you be able to order the food and drinks? Which caterers do you think we should use? We don't want to spend too much money. We have about four hundred pounds to cover food and drink for one hundred students. We need a selection of finger food and soft drinks. I will contact Flying Fish. They're quite cheap, and they will do some discounts for us, as we've used them before at the college. Don't worry, Sam. I'll sort all that out. Excellent. We've covered a lot for today. I will book the main college hall and rooms ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen this week. I think we need to have about two more meetings before the conference. The next one we'll schedule for Wednesday, the sixth of June. Can everyone do that, or would Thursday the seventh of June be better? The first date you said is fine with me. Me too. Yes, that's fine with me as well. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Pause the recording for thirty seconds. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Last thing to mention before we finish up for today is some things that Mr. Peters, our lovely headmaster, has said. As we said at the beginning, he hasn't been so enthusiastic about this conference, and he has given us some rules we have to stick to during the conference. I've made a photocopy of them for everyone. I think we should just go through them now to get them out of the way. Good idea. Well, the first thing Mr. Peters said is that we have to make a record of all the students who attend the conference, as he wants those figures after the event to check that the money he gave us to organise it was worth it. He also wants to know which subject each of the students who attended is going to study at university, to show that we have provided suitable speakers at the conference. He said that he doesn't mind how many speakers we invite, as long as the lectures are well attended. The last requirement was that we help organise the travel arrangements for the speakers. We can discuss the details of this in the next meeting. That all sounds fairly easy to manage. Did Mr. Peters not say anything about tidying up the hall and the rooms after? I would have thought that he would have said something about that. That wasn't something on the list. I could check with him, but the cleaners who clean the college on a regular basis might tidy everything up. They would just have to be paid a bit more. I don't think the conference will produce too much mess anyway. It would be good to get some help with all that anyway. Yes. So that's everything then. 
Let's go for lunch now. I'm starving. <laughs> We can speak about the next lot of things at the next meeting. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about healthy eating. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Pause the recording for one minute. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who has come all the way from Manchester. Dr. Paul Harold, the head of research in nutrition at Manchester University, he is going to talk to us about ways we can improve our lifestyle and fitness. This will include watching what we eat. And being more careful about our calorie intake, as well as taking regular exercise, this is an important current issue. As many people eat too much junk food, and the nation as a whole is fatter than it was 100 years ago. Thank you, James, for your introduction. You are absolutely right. Statistics show that the nation is heavier than it used to be, and this is due to the long hours that we work. And the lack of time we have to prepare healthy meals that are low in fat and sugar. There are some simple steps everyone can take to help improve their general health. Maybe lose some weight first. In the long run, it could lower your cholesterol and blood pressure. The first thing to do in order to check that your weight is healthy is to work out your body mass index or BMI. This is a tool that can help you find out if you are a healthy weight for your height. Obviously, the height of a person will affect what weight they should be. To work out your BMI, you should take your weight in kilograms and divide it by your height in meters. Then you divide the result by your height in meters again. The result you come up with can be checked on a chart to see if your BMI is too high, too low, or about right. Even if your BMI is about where it should be. It is still important to eat a healthy and well-balanced diet. A healthy diet involves consuming appropriate amounts of all the food groups, including an adequate amount of water. Nutrients can be obtained from many different foods, so there are a wide variety of healthy diets. To start with, it is important to eat starchy foods such as bread, cereals, potatoes, rice, and pasta, together with fruit and vegetables. And this should provide the bulk of most meals. Some people wrongly think that starchy foods are fattening. In fact, they contain about half the calories than the same weight of fat. Also, starchy foods often contain a lot of fiber. When you eat starchy foods, you get a feeling of fullness, which helps to control appetite. It is also important to eat at least five portions, and ideally seven to nine portions, of a variety of fruit or vegetables each day. 
If you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, then your chance of developing heart disease, a stroke, or bowel cancer are reduced. You also need a certain amount of protein to keep healthy. However, most people eat more protein than is necessary. You should choose poultry such as chicken or lean meat. There is evidence that eating oily fish helps to protect against heart disease. It is probably the omega-3 fatty acids in the fish oil that help to reduce build-up in the arteries. Aim to eat at least two portions of fish per week, one of which should be oily. Obviously, what we eat is highly important, but it is also crucial to do regular exercise as it strengthens our heart, tones our muscles, and is also good for the mind. We're increasingly living in a world where physical activity has stopped being a day-to-day -day part of our lives. We have domestic appliances to wash and dry for us, and cars to get us around. And with the decline in manual labour, many of us spend our working days sitting at desks. Adults should do a minimum of 30 minutes moderate intensity physical activity five days a week. You don't have to do the whole 30 minutes in one go. Your half hour could be made up of three 10-minute bursts of activity spread through the day if you prefer. The activity can be a lifestyle activity, such as walking to the shops or taking the dog out, or structured exercise or sport, or a combination of these. But it does need to be of at least moderate intensity. For bone health, activities that produce high physical stresses on the bones are necessary. Well, I hope you've learned some interesting facts from this talk and that it will help you to change your lifestyles for the better. Thank you for your attention. And I believe that James has some handouts to give you on this subject. James. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.